So thank you all very much for being here. And Sally, thank you very much. Oh, it's really good of you to spend time with us. Delighted to be here. Thank uh, you for the invitation. So it's great to have somebody who's both been... Isn't this cozy? Say, this is very cozy. Yeah. Um, it's great to have somebody who's both practiced in private practice, now back in private practice, mm -hmm. and also has been in the government for a good long stint. Uh, because when you're general counsel, which I was for a couple of years, some time ago, uh, you know, you, it, it, it's a challenge to know how to deal with the government uh, when you have legal issues that come up. So, so let's talk about what that, that experience is uh, and what it should be. You can help us from both sides, but particularly from the Justice Department side, because a lot of us, at least certainly I never pra practiced in the Justice Department. I don't know that experience. And let's take an example just from, from the headlines today. We have Danska Bank, uh, mm -hmm. which has this money laundering thing through Estonia, like $250 billion, most of which they say now is questionable. And we knew that. The CEO stepped down. But now, today, we learn Department of Justice has sort of called them up and said, uh, we're kind of interested in that. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about that? We're going to investigate it. Uh, give us a sense of, first of all, from the Justice Department's point of view, uh, how does the Justice Department find out about that? I mean, are they reading the Financial Times? Are they reading the Wall Street Journal and saying, wait a second, what's going on? What, how, how likely would they discover something like that? Well, first, I recognize it can be a, a scary and mysterious thing when you hear from the government. And certainly for folks on the outside, whether you're in-house counsel or, or private counsel, I know there oftentimes is, it's like there's this cloak of secrecy around how DOJ is approaching these things and, and what the thinking is behind that. First, in terms of how the department gets matters that are investigated, it comes from the full gamut of things. It could be in the financial industry from suspicious activity reports or other reporting from a financial institution itself or a corresponding financial institution. It could be from someone inside um, who views themselves as a whistleblower, may then come either to DOJ or the SEC or Treasury or other regulators um, to alert the government. Sometimes it can be from clients or those who are participating in financial transactions. It's really a wide variety of sources then. And then the department has to sift through that information and try to make a determination as to um, what is really worthy of the department's attention. So how do you make that determination? Because I assume you get a lot more tips or a lot more leads than you actually pursue, even to the point of calling up the company and asking for information. So what are the sort of criteria that you use in the Justice Department to say, okay, this one we've got to take the next step on? Well, you're right. I mean, certainly neither DOJ nor any of the investigative agencies have sufficient resources to be able to track down every single allegation that's out there. So, you know, it's, it's pretty common sense stuff. You look at the seriousness of the allegation. If this were true, how bad is it? Um, you look at the specificity of the allegation. How credible does it appear on its face? And is there any corroboration for it? Um, sometimes you look at um, the entity or the individuals about whom the allegation is made. Um, is this organization or would they be considered a recidivist? If, do they have a track record of engaging in this kind of conduct? And then there are varying levels of responses. Um, you know, there's the full out, hardcore criminal investigation, search warrants, grand jury subpoenas, interviews. And then there's sort of the softer, more preliminary approach where you call the company and perhaps say, look, we've gotten some information about X. We'd like to talk to you about that. Um, believe it or not, it's, it's not unusual in those situations after there's a conversation with the government for DOJ to say this really doesn't look like this is something that we want to pursue. Um, one of the other regulators may, not something we want to pursue, and they'll move on. So take it from the other side around. Uh, yeah. You're the general counsel, and the call comes in. Let's assume yeah. it's not just a grand jury subpoena, but mm -hmm. a call comes in. Uh, how do you decide how to respond to that? What is the range of possibilities, and when does it make sense to go hard? When does it go soft? How do you do that? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is to get the facts, to have a sense of what actually did happen before you make a determination about how to respond. You know, there are times, I think, when you do want to do the full-out, hardcore defense and fight every step of the way. And likewise, there are times when it's really in the company's interest to be as cooperative as possible because there could be a, a good explanation for that, or at least an explanation that's not as bad as what the government thinks it is. So the first thing you have to do before, in my view, before you make any decisions about how to proceed is to find out what happened. So... Uh, I'm general counsel. I get the call. I say, I got to find out what happened. It might take some time. 
to find that out. What's the Justice Department's reaction? I mean, how long is a reasonable amount of time? At what point does the Justice Department start to think, wait a second, they're really just stalling me. They're not going to get back to me. Yeah, again, this is going to sound like a weaselly answer, um, but it sort of depends on the particulars mm -hmm. of that situation, something that's a really complex situation. DOJ is not going to expect that you'll be in the office the next afternoon. Um, but companies, I think one mistake I think that companies make sometimes is thinking that you've got to have every single fact nailed down before you necessarily go in and do a voluntary disclosure, which is different than obviously what we're talking about here. Or even go into the department and say, look, we've done a preliminary investigation. It looks to us like it's headed this direction, but we can't say for sure yet until we do a more thorough investigation. We'll come back to you when we have. We anticipate the time frame would be three months, six months, 30 days, whatever you think it reasonably would be. And DOJ you know, may push back a bit on the time frame or may ask you some specifics there. We'd like for you to track down X, Y, or Z and get back to us. But usually the department is really anxious to engage and to have that kind of interaction. Because as busy as the folks are at the department, they really don't want to be wasting their time on something that's not worthy of an investigation. So it typically is that response, and I suppose there's a range, but is it going in with a meeting? Is it a written document like a memorandum? Is it a combination of the two? What's most effective from the Justice Department's point of view? I, well, again, it's going to depend, but from my perspective, I always found a combination of the two mm -hmm. to be most effective. Um, I think it is helpful to have a face-to-face. It's a lot easier to vilify folks or to ascribe motives when you're just dealing with people on paper and when you can sit down face to face, um, even when it's counsel for the company, obviously, and be able to talk through things. I think that is a really important step in developing trust. But at the same time, once you're at a point where you have been able to discern what the facts are, having something in writing can be really helpful because not everyone who's going to be in that decision process will necessarily be in your face-to-face -face meeting. There can be people up the chain, for example, who won't be in the meeting, but may need to know the facts. And so having something in writing, and I'm, I'm giving you gross generalizations here. Obviously, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to depend on the particular facts. But having something in writing um, that can be shared with others who aren't there or that you can go back to, to the extent that there are differing recollections about um, the facts that were described can be really helpful. And do I assume, as I go into that meeting if I'm general counsel, uh, do I assume that anything I give you, either in writing or orally, uh, could be used against me and evidence infect you if you get in litigation? Yeah, and sort of the first thing I guess I would say in response to your question is I'm not sure if you're the general counsel that you're the right person to be going into that meeting. Good, so that's good. Who's yeah. the right person? I, I really, and it's not just because I'm an outside lawyer now, but I really think that you really want outside counsel to be handling that, not the general counsel of the company. Um, there can come a point where down the line it may be that the government wants to hear from the general counsel, but oftentimes that's kind of more almost in, in a witness capacity in terms of what was going on within the company. Um, I don't think you want to send the GC in because the GC can be put on the spot and be asked some very difficult questions um, that, that can put the company in, in a bad position. And I would definitely suggest that you have outside counsel go in and from the beginning be dealing with the government on this. As I said, there may come a point where it's helpful for the GC to be part of a particular meeting for a particular purpose, but I, I wouldn't put he or she, I wouldn't put them in there right out of the gate. And is it evidence, whatever they do, including outside counsel? I don't know if I'd say evidence so much. Um, but could you assume if you go to trial and somehow you could contradict yourself? They're going to say, wait a second, I want to introduce some evidence. Exhibit you know, I don't, ever, I don't ever remember a time, and I, and I can't tell you it's never happened, where we, th there was a situation where we said, but no, back in our conference room you said X, but to the extent you sure lose a lot of credibility, mm -hmm if you're making a representation in your interaction with the government on the front end and then you're taking a very different position later. Um, as the government is looking and trying to discern intent, which is what most of these matters end up being about, um, that, that kind of thing, 
is what will make the government very skeptical that there's no bad intent. You mentioned uh, general counsel, it's sort of a rare thing for the general counsel to come in. What about CEOs? Because when we had the, some of the banking fines up here, mm-hmm. there were some famous incidents where like Jamie Dimon went mm-hmm. in to meet with Eric Holder, mm-hmm. things like that. When does the Justice Department ask for that? Or do they ever? Is that a voluntary thing on the part of the company? Do you ever ask for the, I want to see the CEO, thank you very much. Yeah, it's pretty rare, but yes, it does happen. I've done it. It's usually where the CEO's conduct, him or herself, is at issue, or there's a really systemic issue with the company, and you want to hear from the CEO, not just about what happened, but if you're in the context of resolving a matter, um, what they are putting in place to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And sometimes the government will want to pressure test whether this is a pretty little paper program um, that, that the company is giving you to check the box, or, or this is something that, that they are earnest about and that is going to be real. How does but just- that's a, it's, a, it's a rare thing. To, to ask to talk to the CEO. It's probably why we hear about it, because it's rare, and so right. it makes the press when that happens. Yeah. Uh, how does the Justice Department de- decide which part of it will deal with it? For example, you've got U.S. Attorney's offices. Mm-hmm. You're a U.S. Attorney. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have Maine Justice. How do you divvy that work up, and what does it tell me, if I'm the general counsel, that I'm hearing from the U.S. Attorney, or I'm hearing from Maine Justice, or what part of the organization I'm hearing from? Yeah, I, I wouldn't try to necessarily read tea leaves about whether you're getting a call from the criminal division or a U.S. attorney's office. Um, Much as I wish it weren't this way, sometimes it's the one who gets there first. Um, We used to, in fact, have some tug-of-wars between offices if there could be um, different U.S. attorney's offices, um, both of whom have venue over something. We tried to get past the sort of first one to plant the flag wins in terms of it, it going to that particular office because that's not really the best way. And instead, if there were differences that would then come actually to the deputy, to to my office, we would try to to make it on on the decision based on factors other than that in terms of, you know, where most of the conduct occurred, where the company's located, where witnesses are, those kind of common sense things. But it can be sometimes some U.S. attorney's offices are reading the Financial Times or reading other things and look and find interesting information and they're very aggressive about identifying mm-hmm. cases. Um, sometimes on, on particularly large, significant matters, you might pair both a U.S. Attorney's Office and the Criminal Division or the Civil Division. If it's a civil matter or one that starts as a civil matter, it may be both. But I wouldn't take from that s- that there is some litmus test as to how serious it is based on whether the inquiry comes from the U.S. Attorney's Office or a litigating division of Maine Justice. So assume that you've had some back and forth with some part of justice, whether it's U.S. Mm-hmm. Attorney or whether it's Maine Justice, and you as the client feel that you're not making any headway. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, they're not listening to you, they don't understand, maybe you just think maybe they have a bee in their bonnet and they're not being fair to you. What do you do? You know, that's another thing, actually, that I think that um, defense lawyers didn't do often enough, and that's appeal up the chain. Now, I think you have to be careful. You don't want to be whining about every little thing that the line AUSA is doing. Um, You're really not going to get an audience on that. But if you believe that you are being treated in a fundamentally unfair way, or that you have an AUSA or a line attorney who just, you know, sees things the wrong way, you need to work your way up the chain on that. Don't go directly to the Attorney General or the DAC. I mean, you, you got to start lower than that because DOJ is a very hierarchical organization and they'll send you back to another supervisor. But I know when I was U.S. Attorney and when I was DAG, if there were prosecutors who really were being unfair and really were taking a, a strained view of something, I happen to believe that was the exception rather than the rule, but if that was happening, I wanted to know about it. The U.S. attorney or or folks at Maine Justice can't do anything about it if they don't know. So again, you need to be judicious and when you do it, but you don't have to just sit back and take it if you think that that the matter is being handled in in, an inappropriate way. What about overlapping jurisdiction? Because sometimes Justice Department has some jurisdiction, but you have the SEC, you have the FTC, you have the FCC, you have different organizations. All sorts of acronyms there. Exactly, exactly. We just saw that with uh, with Tesla, Elon Musk, where you had an SEC investigation, you also had 
uh, the Justice Department investing as well. How does that get sorted out within the government, and how do you avoid, if you're the, cl the client again, getting sort of whipsawed? Um, as we're talking, this person, that person, that person over there. Yeah, sometimes it gets sorted out better than others, that's for sure. And, and the department, and particularly in the last you know, three, four years, maybe five years has been, um, tried to be much more intentional. And when I say the department, I'm talking about DOJ there, much more intentional about coordinating um, with other agencies, because sometimes it's not just other federal agencies. Um, the states may be involved or foreign investigative authorities are involved. And that can really put a company in a bad spot. So, again, I think that's something you raise. If DOJ, usually there's an agency that, if not um, officially, sort of unofficially, is in the lead. I think you want to raise that with them. There may be more coordination going on behind the scenes than you know about. Um, but it, it, it's a tricky thing. And certainly when it comes to resolutions, there has always been, and Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein has underscored the importance of trying to coordinate fines or penalties so that there's like one big pot and you make a decision as a government as to what the appropriate consequence should be for this and then to divide that between agencies. Again, that happens better sometimes than others. And also sometimes you're not on the same time frame. So for example, DOJ may be ready to wrap up its case, but there could be another regulatory agency that's two years behind. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the department is not going to just sit on its resolution for a couple of years while that other agency catches up. When you refer to fines or penalties, uh, how does the Department of Justice calculate that? Because I know, again, going back to banking, just one of the things I've talked to some general counsels and some CEOs of banks who felt that coming out of the last go-around, yeah. there was some arbitrariness from the Justice Department, that they just, they're just they just picking numbers out of the hat. Yeah. You know, it's $3 billion, it's $6 billion, whatever. And people have complained sort of bitterly, frankly, saying, yeah. I, we knew we had to pay something, we knew we'd done something wrong, no question about that. Mm -hmm. But it was just, they seemed to be just picking numbers out of the air. Yeah, and, and I think it can feel particularly that way when you're talking about resolutions that start with a B. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, that, that, you know, is, is particularly acute. Look, I, I'm not saying that the department has done that perfectly. It is an art, not a science a lot of times. But in the financial cases, which I wasn't directly negotiating, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I can't give you the, you know, mm -hmm. from the front lines view. But the way DOJ generally looks at this is they try to look at similar matters in the past and how those matters have been resolved and how is this particular case um, the same or different from that. Now, there's usually a whole lot of discussion with the individual entity with whom you are negotiating about precisely that because it is a very common thing um, for the defense to be saying, but in this case over here, you let them settle for X amount. Why is ours twice that amount? And here are all the reasons why it shouldn't be. So there's usually a whole lot of discussion back and forth between DOJ and the specific entity. What I don't think perhaps we did as good a job of as we should have and is being able to, to describe more generally for the public what the criteria are there. You can't really get into the specifics of that um, but certainly, for example, in the FCPA context, mm -hmm. DOJ has tried to be more transparent, again, not perfect by any means, but tried to be more transparent about um, how matters are resolved and what the factors are. But there's, there's certainly room for improvement in that regard. We've been talking until now uh, with the situation where the Justice Department reaches out to you yeah. and says you have a problem. What about the problem where you discover something within your company? Justice Department doesn't know about it yet. What do you do? How do you handle it? How do you make the, the, I think, difficult decision whether you volunteer? You go in and say, look, we found something you should know about it, as opposed to, let's let it lie. Yeah. You know, that's to state the obvious here. Um, one of the most difficult decisions, I think, that you have to make. I mean, the idea that you're raising your hand and saying, oh, DOJ, over here, um, we've got this problem we want to tell you about, feels sort of counterintuitive, I think, um, to wanting to protect the interest of the company. And I certainly wouldn't advocate that you do that every time, but I think you need to consider several factors because there are substantial benefits um, to, to companies when they do voluntarily disclose. And certainly one of the first things you've got to think about is how likely is it that the department or another regulator is going to find out about this anyway? Maybe not right now, but eventually. 
And, you know, there's no perfect way of knowing that. But if you got, if you learned about this from your tip line, for example, you know, that's a hint that that person who's calling your tip line is probably not just calling your tip line, but if, if they don't see something happen about this, is likely to also raise their hand and to go to someone else. Or if, if, you, if it's a situation where you might have a key tam relator um, who may want to, to file a claim there. I think you have to look at um, how pervasive the conduct is in making that decision. If it's a single act, you know, halfway across the world and, and you've remediated that and it's not going to happen again, that may be one thing. But if it's pervasive conduct throughout the company, again, how likely is that that that's going to stay secret? And then I think you kind of consider what kind of story, when I say story, I don't mean as in false, but, but what do you have to say to the government when you go in? either about what the underlying conduct was or about what you've done to remediate and to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Do you have something good to say? But, and, and again, again, I get it's counterintuitive, but we really tried, for example, with the FCPA pilot project that's now been instituted, uh, revised a little bit more permanently, to really make it clear to organizations that there should be a substantial gulf and the benefits that you get from raising your hand and voluntarily disclosing and merely cooperating after the government comes knocking on your door. Um, last sort of thing, and I'm sorry I've gone on so long no. here, is the other benefit to think about is that if you've made a decision, it probably is in the interest of the company to voluntarily disclose. You have an opportunity to do what some might call a little forum shopping here you can make a decision about to whom you want to go in and disclose, whether it's to Maine Justice or to a U.S. Attorney's Office or, or different U.S. Attorney's Offices. And that sometimes can make a difference in how an investigation progresses. And you have an opportunity to frame this for the government as opposed to investigators and prosecutors going out and finding things and sort of drawing their own conclusions about what was going on here, and then you're trying a after the fact, if you haven't disclosed, to, to persuade them that what they've been believing for the last six or eight months isn't true. So you have a chance both to pick your form and to frame the issue. And that can be a really powerful thing for a company. We're going to turn to questions from the audience in just a moment or two, but you have uh, a wealth of experience both at the U.S. Attorney's Office and also as the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, and recognize that each case is different mm -hmm. in its own facts. What are the patterns you've seen about when in-house counsel handled it well and when they've handled it poorly? What are the common no. themes that say, you know, when they did it well, they tended to do this. When they did it well, that was the mistake they made. There must yeah. be some common themes. Uh, at the risk of oversimplifying, don't be a jerk. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> it's when, and there are lots of different ways one can be a jerk. Um, <laughs> But sort of coming in and assuming that the folks on the other side of the table, on the government side, are acting in bad faith, that they've got an ax to grind, that, you know, that's the kind of thing that whether it's conscious or subconscious really puts people in a defensive posture. And so I think sort of coming in and assuming bad faith or making accusations of misconduct, unless there truly is misconduct there, that's one way so then sort of the issue is joint when you do that. And it's going to be really hard to work through things um, after that. Um, when I've seen it most effective is when, you know, when you do a disclosure, I'm not suggesting that you should go in and just give a bland recitation of the facts. You know, that's a really important time for advocacy on behalf of the company. So I think you should be an advocate, but being willing to concede when there are problematic things from a factual standpoint, but then advocating why it may not be sort of as problematic as the government thinks it is or why in the relative scheme of things um, that's not something that's really worth the government's resources. Having that credibility um, is essential. Misstating something and not correcting it later, perhaps you believed it was true at the time, but you learned later it's not true. If you don't come back and correct that and the government you know, learns later that you knew that. Once you've lost your credibility, it's, it really, it's hard to get that back. And unfortunately, that then inures to the detriment of your client as well, because the conduct of the lawyers representing the company 
ends up getting attributed to the company as well. Whether officially or not, we're all human. Um, that just happens. You have to pick your outside counsel carefully too, it sounds you like. Do. You, know, yeah. you don't want your outside counsel to be jerks. Yeah, you know, plus you don't really want to work with them if they're <laughs> jerks anyway. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah. that's fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so I've had you to myself all, way too long. So let's, let's have some questions from the audience, please, if we could. That was tremendous. Um, so far, we have one question. I encourage you guys to get on Slido.com and submit more questions if you'd like for the last five minutes we have here with Sally. Um, but the question that's been submitted is, looking ahead at the next few years, how do you see DOJ's enforcement priorities uh, evolving? Yeah. You know, um, I'm not sure that they're going to evolve substantially in the white collar area. I mean, certainly there have been substantial changes from the Obama administration to this administration outside the white collar area. And drugs and immigration and um, environmental issues, um, civil rights sort of in, in those areas. But in the white collar area, um, there hasn't been yet really big substantive changes with respect to policies. You don't see the same emphasis on it um, from a rhetorical standpoint from the attorney general or others. Um, but that doesn't mean that the lawyers, for example, in the fraud section at the criminal division of the Department of Justice are any less committed to the cases that they're doing today that they were doing two years ago. Nor does it mean that U.S. attorney's offices are any less committed. They don't have, there's not been an emphasis from resources standpoint. Um, there, there was no request for additional resources from DOJ in the white collar area, either at Maine Justice or in the U.S. attorney's offices. So there could be some reduction just in, in the overall enforcement effort, but that's going to be pretty slight, I think. Um, so I think really that the change in enforcement is more outside the white collar area than inside. Great. Well, that is the only question we've got. All right. well, so I'll ask about politics. Uh, in, oh, in, in, Look no, at no, the time. No, 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 no. <laughs> no this, is, this is a very tame, as politics question goes, it's very tame. I mean, uh, elections have consequences. Right. We've always heard that. And, mm -hmm. and that's not just true in this last election. Every election has consequences. Yeah. How should the balance be struck with the Justice Department? Because you don't want the whole thing changing every four years or every eight years when there's a new president in. And there has to be some independence of the Justice Department. At the same time, it makes sense that there's some policy changes. What's sure. the right balance there? And over time, as you've seen different regimes come and go, uh, where has it worked well? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Elections do have consequences. And as much as I may personally disagree with some of the current policies of the department with respect to those other issues that I just mentioned, um, that kind of comes with the territory. You have to expect that part to happen. I think um, what you don't expect to happen and what both parties, at least since Watergate, have, have really scrupulously observed is the division between the White House and the Justice Department when it comes to interaction on specific cases or investigations. That's really essential uh, to the rule of law. And so that's something, I think, that really shouldn't be compromised. Well, there was a reason in Watergate, as I recall, Dita Beard, right? There was, well, the, that, yeah. there was a scandal in the antitrust division where there was attempted interference. Well, and then there was the Watergate thing itself. Yeah, the Watergate thing itself, <laughs> yeah. exactly, exactly. There was that, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Other questions, yeah? That's the only one we've gotten. All right, well, we covered everything then. That's great. So you, that did <laughs> you did it. <laughs> Sally Yates, it's really great to have her. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all. Sally. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.